house, it will get warm, so I had the big fan glass until the very last second. Um, my name is Tamara Nechikowski. I am the chair of the Library Board of Trustees. The Library Board of Trustees decided to host this event to bring some experts in to answer questions and present information about um, the problems for the Water Center District. Um, there have been some issues with the information being available to people. And the goal of this evening's event is to allow everyone who came this evening as a member of the public to ask this group um, any questions that they might have. There are a couple of ground rules. I'm going to attempt to sort of moderate this, not in the way that we would officially sort of Robert's rules be in a political meeting. You are welcome to stand up and state your name and where you live if you want to, but you're not required to do that at a meeting like this. Um, I am going to keep off limits questions that have to do with um, the political issues in town around water and sewer. This group is not really here and qualified to talk about what our own in-house questions might be about that. We might be able to have another meeting about that. Um, I'm also going to keep off limits anything that has to do with <coughs> the um, criminal activity that has been mentioned because this group is not here to speak about that or to bother to talk about that. A couple of things that I was thinking about today um, were the fact that the Water and Sewer District does not only impact people that live in the Water and Sewer District, but the ways that it impacts our entire community. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but our entire municipal operation is in the Water and Sewer District. Police, fire, town hall, school, um, library. So everybody that receives services from the town, all of those entities are within the realms of water and sewer district. Um, I was also thinking about how the reputation that could potentially come onto the town if we have these types of issues with our water and the publicity that's beginning to come out about it, it affects the reputation of our town and everybody's property that is in town. Um, whether you have a well or your own water and sewer, we all draw from the same water table. There's potential impacts there. And taxes, if our property values are dropped in the district because of our water, we'll pay less taxes, but everybody else in town will pay more to compensate for what we are paying because our property value got even lower. Um, if everyone in town had to put a well in, if everybody that's in the district now had to put a well in, we'd probably kill the town. So those are the things that I was thinking about today, and I'm really happy tonight to have the guests that we have here to speak to you. We're going to start off with Ray um, McNeil, who is the Brownsville Water Sewer District Superintendent. Are you Chris? Yes. Oh. Your own name on there? Ray is going to make um, about a 15-minute presentation of, of some information just to give us a general overview of Brown's Water and Sewer District. He is our superintendent. And once he's done, we will open the floor to questions, and we will be directing the questions to everyone on the panel. Um, let me just quickly introduce us here. Um, Dr. Jim Malley is the UNH uh, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. John Abbey is from DES. Cynthia Clevins is also from DES. Chris Berg is an engineer from um, Brighton Pierce. Frank Roselli is the former chair of the Water and Sewer District. And Ray McNeil, of course, is the superintendent of the Water District. So Ray, if you want to go ahead and start your presentation, that would be great. So this presentation could go 15 minutes or three hours, obviously. So I'm going to try and make it short and sweet just so that we can get through the, the information. Um, there's going to be a lot of information on the slide. There's going to be a lot of information on the slides. We can go back to any slides anybody's interested in and talk more in detail about it. Uh, just, just give us a little idea of uh, what, what the infrastructure uh, entails. Um, we're going to be a little water heavy just uh, due to the fact that we've recently had an asset management study completed, so we've got a lot of accurate data that's to date. So uh, the wastewater size is not going to be as detailed. So uh, you see that picture there is of the district. So uh, water district infrastructure. So we've got um, water treatment systems. We've got two bedrock wells on Foundry Street known as the Porter Well. Um, we 
we treat for the removal of arsenic and benzene at that location. Um, we've also got one gravel pack well, uh, known as the General Sullivan well. Uh, that's our workforce. So we're, we're maintaining um, primarily nine months out of the year, General Sullivan is able to produce the water needed. Um, the, off, the other you know, three to four months, um, we, we have to run Porter Well regularly to offset the, the high demand for the summertime. Um, so, and then at, at General Sullivan, we're treating for pH adjustment. Um, we're disinfecting, uh, and we're also treating um, at both wells for uh, corrosion control with polyethylphosphate. It's actually not in this slide. So, um, the distribution system consists of uh, one and a half inch to 12 inch diameter mains. Um, the oldest pipes in the system are cast iron uh, installed near the mill in the school. Um, the total uh, inventory of uh, material consists of cast iron, asbestos cement, buckle iron, and, and there is some unknown materials um, at this point. So we also have a water storage tank. Um, sits up behind the transfer station. It's 50 feet tall, um, it, and it has approximately 750,000 gallons worth of storage. Uh, and that was installed in 96. So, what it's worth, um, and this is pulling out of the asset management study that right here stood for. So, we've got six miles of pipe, we've got the tank, we've got the three wells, we have 63 hydrants, 600 plus services. So, the total replacement cost of the system is greater than $12 million. Um, so, obviously, that's considered a major capital asset. Um, water prioritization. When we're, we're talking about this, again, we pulled this priority list from the asset management plan and study as we were uh, navigating through that project. So projects that are a priority right now, um, Porter Well, we need to integrate, uh, we need integration and automation um, so that we can operate that facility 24-7. Uh, um, currently, we cannot do that. It has to be operated uh, during the work hours. It has to have an operator there. Um, the standards that have been set there so that we can provide uh, clean water leaving that facility because of the complex treatment process requires somebody right now to manually do the checks. Um, so that's, a, that's definitely a big, uh, big project that needs some attention. General Sullivan, same idea. Uh, we, we don't need as much integration uh, other than the new, uh, the new equipment that we're looking to install there. And we'll get into that a little further on. Uh, operations, uh, replace variable frequency drive at General Sullivan. That's actually, you can check that off the list. Uh, about three months ago, we had a flood there. Took out the, the old drive, um, and through an insurance claim, we were able to upgrade that. And there's some slides to see what that project looked like completely. Um, booster pump preventive maintenance at Porter Well. Um, that's attached to the benzene removal system. Um, currently, it's offline because we've shown no detect or very low detectable limits of benzene in our raw water for uh, many quarters running now. Uh, so we've got the approval from the state uh, to not be treating, but we're monitoring to make sure if it does creep back in, we have the ability to turn uh, turn the system back on. But those pumps, um, booster pumps are due for some general maintenance, major general maintenance and overhaul. Um, moving over to General Sullivan, uh, just basic Building installation, um, the main door needs to be replaced. Some low hanging fruit there that needs to be addressed. Um, and then install uh, automated flow control sump pump at General Sullivan. So like I said, we had a flood there. And the sump pump doesn't have any alarming um, controls or parameters to let me know that if there's an issue there. So when we did have the flood, we were lucky that an operator had gone back after his routine checks and found that it had been flooded. Um, otherwise, I would have gotten an alarm saying that we lost power due to the short circuit because of the flood. Um, and then hydrant maintenance and flushing. So water projects, uh, number one, getting into that again, this is just a quick shot of uh, what I just discussed at both these locations uh, with a, with a uh, total estimated cost to the upgrades. Um, there's a good majority of both of these projects that can be done in-house by not only myself, but our, our operators. So uh, there's a lot of value there. We can save quite a bit of money by, by going through this process and, and implementing these upgrades in-house. Um, we can go back to this at a later time. Um, the 
these are some just before and after shots of what I walked into and the adjustments and upgrades we made over the last 18 months to help with controlling um, uh, the chemical addition. So this is General Sullivan. That's a shot of the chemical addition system that was there, and it's going to move ahead on me. But this is what we have now. So we, we upgraded the system uh, to peristaltic pumps. Um, their flow pace now, um, the next phase would be to get some readbacks on them so I can be alarmed if they stop, but that would be in that next phase. Right, and you go back to the extension cords and for sure and whatnot. Yeah, so I mean to point this out, you know, you've got extension cords, and the reason those were there is all this equipment used to be in the basement. And the attempt was to bring all the, the day tanks upstairs because it, we were transferring chemicals into the basement. So, you know, the past crew, unlike myself, they weren't electricians, so this was the this was the fix for them. They ran an extension cord down through the hatch and they plugged into the outlet that was being used in the basement. So obviously the, the next, you know, this phase here is brought down to the conduit, wired into the control panel um, correctly, and then um, again, flow pace, which we didn't have that capability before. So the flow pacing gives us um, a much more stable water lead in General Sullivan, which has been part of the uh, part of the corrosion issue uh, that we've been contending with. So this, this upgrade was to, to, to combat that. So another shot, this was, as it says there, this was the uh, control lab. Um, that's actually an upgrade from what I walked into. You can see there's a pH meter there and some bottles for testing. When I got here, there was no testing being done at the facility. Um, the testing on the water was being done um, during our monthly bacteria samples. That's when we get up chlorine residuals, and that's when we get potentially a pH reading. Um, now the standard is seven days a week, we're getting pH, chlorine, uh, uh, pH, chlorine, alkalinity, and uh, polyethyl phosphate residuals at that location to maintain uh, the most consistent treatment possible. This is just a quick shot of the chemical storage. Um, to the left there, um, this was approved by the, the current commission. That to the very left is a, some of you may have heard the conversation about the chemical transfer pumps. Um, that was a huge investment and an upgrade for the safety of the crew um, so that when we transfer the residuals, you know, in those 50 gallon drums, there's usually 10 or 15 gallons left that we can't leave due to the fact that we might run out of chemical overnight, so we have to transfer prematurely. And that system allows one operator to set the, pump, uh, set the pump up, turn it on, and it's got a nozzle like you have at a gas station so you can control it, um, which is a lot different than the, the system we had in place before. And then the eyewash station was also approved, and, and we implemented that recently. Um, this is the basement I was talking about that flooded. So, um, again, failed heating system. That's a temporary heating system that we had in place to get through this winter. Um, the heating system's top right that failed. You can see it's tagged out. And just above the, the heating system there is, uh, now we can do it here. That's, that's the new uh, control panel that was replaced due to the flood. Uh, but that was, that's a huge upgrade that we were looking to do this year. So we're, we're fortunate to have got that accomplished already. Did you do that in house? We did not do that in-house. Uh, Lavalette Lab controlled the installation for us. Um, they, did, you know, they, they do all our control work. They've been, they were the original control company that did the original installation. They know our system really well, so um, it, it, worked, it worked out well. So again, this is kind of what we're dealing with. And that's where we're at now. Still some, there's still some work to be done, but you know, we're moving in the right direction. So this is just a shot, you see the uh, backup generator there, but what we're really focusing on here is the, the mini split system there. That was the replacement to the heating system that failed downstairs. So that's an electrical heating system. Um, they're super efficient, but they also provide air conditioning. And it's not because the operators want to be out in the field and sit in a cool room. It's because we've turned that into a lab now, and that lab requires climate control so that we can process uh, the samples properly so we can get accurate readings. Um, and this is just a, a quick overview again of the, the upgrades. 
Did you realize the chemical savings with the aerosolic pumps? Yeah, I mean, I've got the data uh, for this chemical savings. Not only the, the flow pacing is really what, what's obviously part of the chemical savings. Um, we have definitely cut back on certain chemicals, but we've also increased others that we found that we were not pumping enough in. Um, and that one, that one chemical being caustic, um, we were introducing caustic, but not at a high enough level, so we were never you know, maximizing the pH range that we wanted. So a lot of that caustic that we were pumping for, you know, years was, really wasn't doing us a lot. And that's, caustic is our most expensive chemical. So um, we are using more of it, but we're getting what we're supposed to be getting. For the um, so this is just a quick shot in terms of uh, the evaluation of the facilities um, that uh, right here stood for us. And then also, also just, um, prioritizing again in terms of the upgrade. So online pH and chlorine analyzer, uh, integration uh, PLC for automation, and that's for chemical dose adjustments. Uh, VFD, we can check that off, we've done it. Um, the flood and sump pump sensors, we still need to get involved in that, and the transient voltage surge suppression. Um, that area, for some reason, we do have a lot of brownouts, and it's something that we deal with there, so uh, definitely high on priority. So this is gonna start stepping us into portal well. Some before and afters. This is, um, you know, this is what we're using for pro uh, process control out there now. Um, just like general at Porter in the past, there was no process control. Uh, what was happening is the, the system would be turned on, um, and it would operate um, in the manner it was set. So it was almost set at the beginning. Nothing was flow paced. The dose was set at the at the beginning of the installation of the well house. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of checks and balance going on to make sure that the water leaving that facility uh, met the standards. So um, this, is, uh, this is a pretty cool little shot here. So through the asset management study, we had the great Pierce brought in a uh, gentleman that does 3D imaging. And this is a shot that you could never see because really we're looking at three walls there. Um, so it gives you a good idea of what's going on at Porter and the complexity of the system. So to the the white system there is the uh, benzene removal. Uh, to the left uh, of that is our arsenic removal system. Uh, and then to the very left of that is our chemical storage area right now. Um, another interesting shot, that, that's a wall, so I don't even know how he was able to provide this shot, but this is uh, giving you an idea from the back side, which normally you have to crawl through there. Uh, so pretty cool. And then and just another vantage point there. So uh, again, the evaluation of Porter Well, um, install, rem install remote communications is data. It's, it's at this point, and, and we can get into it with Cindy, um, it, we, we definitely feel that's the highest priority in terms of uh, any resolutions to the water quality issues on Willie and the surrounding streets, uh, the most immediate solution. Um, installation of online pH and chlorine analyzers, and there's one more to that, and that's a turbidity meter. This turbidity is a huge uh, measurement tool that we're using to be able to uh, treat the arsenic uh, at the level we are right now. Uh, the next thing, again, integration. Uh, HVAC improvements is, is a must. Um, and then construction of a building, uh, an addition to the building uh, to provide a lab space and chemical separation, which is much needed out there. We've got many companies that they mixed. Actually, Dr. Mallory pointed this out on our first floor. Um, we've got um, um, the, what were the two? Uh, Marriottic acid and, and uh, sodium yeah. hydrochloride, right? Yeah. So, so those strong two, acid and chlorine should, yeah. shouldn't be together. Shouldn't be together, which they were yeah. right next to each other. And he pointed out to me really quickly to have them separated because if they mix, it's, it's chlorine gas, which is obviously deadly. So um, we've sensed on that, but um, we still need to uh, look at continuing on with that process and getting uh, yeah. a little more. <coughs> professional separation. Um, Short-term capital investment, this came out of uh, right here's the study. Um, I'm sure, I think some people have seen this. Uh, I'll go through it real quick. Number one item topic is <coughs> street, uh, Locus and Prospect Street. Now the whole job total is uh, 1.2 million uh, estimated. Um, it could be done in sections and that's a topic that we can go down that road, but the whole project is 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 1.2, and, and Willie being the the street having the most issues, um, 
just replacing Lily, there's speculation that it might not be the, the, the ultimate fix because we've got online casts surrounding and Lily's got a low point and there's a very good potential that that online cast surrounding is still going to leach and we're going to gather it in a low point. So it's definitely a, something to discuss about when we go after this, uh, the direction we take. Um, the Port of Well Improvements uh, is it, high priority as well um, to get, get the um, automation up there so that we can operate that facility truly to offset General Sullivan when it's running at a 50-50 blend or, you know, what, maybe it's a, you know, 30, 70, how do we end up doing it? It's going to be consistent. That's the goal that was also identified through um, the control, uh, corrosion control study that was performed by Wright Pierce. Um, General Sullivan Well, again, we, we've covered that. That's just the cost to the $30,000. The storage tank, tank inspection, which is due, I think, every five years, um, it's $20,000. And we're coming up on our fifth year right now. So we, next year, we have to budget for that. Um, excuse me. And then the distribution system in, in basically the village district, right? So downtown, all that online cast, all that other than Main Street that was replaced in the near future the, recently, um, needs to be addressed in the plan needs to be put in place. Long-term projects, um, you know, supply storage distribution. So develop an additional groundwater source, um, you know, estimated cost of a million dollars. Again, storage tank inspection because that's an ongoing process. And then distribution. So the goal would be to replace all known cast iron pipe in the system. Um, not only because it's, it's the weak link, but it's where we're going to have our, you know, water quality issues. Sorry, well, this is long term, but what are you talking like time-wise? So, sure, so I mean, that, that's a good question for the community, right? What What is a long-term plan look like? And, you know, we can pick Chris to bring a little bit about that, but it can be, you know, five to ten years. It could be a 20-year plan. I mean, it depends on how you prioritize the projects. And if you have a true plan in place, it can be a long-term 20-year plan as long as you're, you're meeting each goal each year, right? If you start missing things, then that long-term plan falls apart real quick. You know, so you can definitely spread it out. Um, and there's, there's different ways to, to manipulate a long-term plan that can be, you know, fairly cost-effective. Um, so wastewater, uh, like I said, a little, not quite as heavy on current information, but I'm going to go into the things that I recommend uh, based on my ability and knowledge of the facility. So, Project number one, pump galley, automatic transfer switch number two, secondary clarifier, uh, chemical addition, oxidation ditch, and then really paying attention to the biolog biological phosphorus removal and, and preparing for permit changes because they are coming. We've been tipped off. I'm going to speak to that tonight. I mean, we're going to have permit changes that are going to offer challenges that are going to require upgrades to, to permit uh, processes. Uh, maintenance, annual line cleaning and inspection, so that's, you know, CATV, uh, getting, a, getting a robot in the collection system and, and taking a, a pictures and looking to see where we're at and, you know, not only are we cleaning it, but we're finding out where we might potentially have issues so that we can correct them before it fails uh, and we're not reacting. Um, chlorine control, uh, chlor excuse me, chlorine contact chamber um, needs repair, uh, the, the concrete that sets the baffles up, um, is very much shape. The system works fine, it's more of a cosmetic, but it, it definitely does need to be addressed. Uh, and then manhole repairs around the town, um, definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, so we talked about the, the pumping galley. Um, you know, I, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, we can, we can wrap back to this so I can speed it up, but this is number one, highest priority at the wastewater treatment facility at this time. Um, this is a breakdown, just a scorecard on it, reasons why we need to do it, you know, obviously the benefits and, and the risk if we don't. So we can do it in-house for $50,000. It has been uh, said by two different engineering firms that if we go out to bid, it's going to be 150 or more to have it done. And it's been agreed upon that the ability in-house to do it at $50,000 um, is, is possible. Ray, can I interrupt you for a second? I'm Ray Vermette. I live at 27 Scoutland Road, and I also oversee the City of Dover's wastewater facility. I worked with Ray for five years, and 
there's nothing at that treatment plant that he can't do himself with his own staff. We've done it dough. We do a lot. We do more with less. And that's the mindset that he's had. One thing I'd like you to do, Ray, is sure. go through your credentials as far as start out with your master electrician. When Ray wanted to come over to Rollinsford, I didn't want to see him go. But I wrote him a letter of recommendation stating what the district would get, which I live in Rollinsford, so I thought it was kind of a win-win. I was sorry to see him go because he was kind of like my right-hand man, and he did an excellent job. But being a master electrician, all the things that you see, the, the extension cords and whatnot, he's done this on his own. He is more than capable of doing this work. And I don't think that he's given the tools and, and the support that he needs to do it. I mean, I've dealt with this district for 25 years. I don't have a home in the district anymore, but I still live in town. And it's always do it the cheapest. The cheapest is not always the best. It's not the mindset of uh, we'll do it right because we do it twice. Talking about things in unlined pipe and things like that, I spoke about that 25 years ago and nobody wanted to hear it. And now we're at the point where we're going to replace it again. So. You know, this is a community that we all live in, and we want to do it right the first time. We need to look at what the cost benefit is to do it right the first time. I know Doe is a little different than Rollinsford, but that's the mindset that we have. We do things, Ray will tell you, we do it right the first time, and it saves you money in the long run. But not allowing him to be able to do this stuff, I think, is wrong. He's more than capable of doing it. I'm sorry to interrupt, no, but thank I want to throw that in there. You know, Ray's my mentor. I came in with no experience with wastewater, and I learned under Rick and that. Um, and I learned these practices from him. And you know, anybody can do some research on how Dover's facilities operate, and they're top notch. So thank you for that, son. I appreciate it. Um, so you know, obviously, we understand that 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 definitely capable of getting that project done for fifty thousand dollars. Ray, before you move on, yeah. that was um, one of the warrant articles this past. March, right? So it, the it was, funds sorry. have been approved by the people. It's just you you haven't had the approval to go ahead. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, so that was approved. That that process, uh, the installation was approved. Um, that is the, the the warrant article was designed so that the money would come out of fund balance. So meaning there's no cost to ratepayers, right? So that's money that we have saved that we could we we've already established that we can draw it out. Uh, the fifty thousand dollars that comes out still leaves us a healthy fund balance on paper, so it's not putting us in a bad spot. Uh, but yes, that was approved, and uh, the project is already—it's ready to go. I just I honestly need the support to pull the trigger with the vendors. Everything's ready to happen. Um, we just—we're not at that point. Ray, right, can you go back to your credentials? We didn't get into that. Raise a master electrician and yeah. also take it from there. Yeah, so I'm a master electrician. I, I stumbled into this trade um, under, for Sonny as an electrician. Um, and I, like I said, I, I mentored under Sonny. Um, in the seven years I worked for him, I achieved my grade four wastewater. Um, we, we did a number of other things. What else did we get certified there for? Tank Underground storage yes, tanks. All kinds of things. Um, but, you know, important to what we're doing here, uh, when I transitioned to this community, um, I've since achieved my grade two distribution license for water uh, and my grade one treatment for water. So, um, adequately qualified to do the job. Sure. sure. We're, Thank you. We're at seven. Yeah. So, do you have any other really important highlights? Because I think people are getting the idea that you've yep. really gathered all this information and maybe we'll have the opportunity to put this online. Let's just get some pictures real quick because it's sure. so people can see. I, I want to be sure we can turn the lights year. on by yep. people. And thank you for signing for people. May I just ask, I don't, I'm Mike Gibbons from Locust Street, I don't understand, it, it was approved at the town meeting and, and it's scheduled? It, it was approved and it is not scheduled at this point because, um, well, it, that's a question for the commissioners. Um, the, the explanation I've been given is that it was approved to spend, uh, but they have the ability to not spend if they decide they don't want to. For whatever reason, so um, it's definitely a possible. Um, the, the water district approved it at the annual meeting. Okay. Okay. So it is. It's approved. That the the one article is already written up and, and ready to roll. So, so why isn't moving forward? The, the commissioners at this point in time don't feel there's enough uh, data collected uh, and feel comfortable with my ability to do the installation. Thank you. Who presented it at the state meeting? At the Annual meeting? Um, Frank we Roselli we weren't allowed to really. presented what he could, but there wasn't a whole lot of talking points on any of the Warren articles. Is um, that why there's not enough information to go ahead? Right. 
we had we had at that meeting, and, and I don't want to bring mud in, so we're going to keep this clean. Right, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm entering here. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just give you a quick look at what happened. All right, at the annual meeting. Several of the people that are here today as experts were present to present the case and the argument to the district or anyone within the district who has the right to vote to decide on these things. And they were not allowed to present the information that they brought that night. I was at that meeting and I got the idea that night. I'm like, well, we're going to bring all these people back so that we have a chance to actually hear the story of what we voted for and what should potentially happen. So the sticking point right now is that the current Board of Commissioners has not moved things forward that people voted for at the annual meeting. This is political, and I don't want to have this be focused on the politics. Okay, sorry. But that is a political piece a, yeah, of the story, which I would be happy to organize another meeting and we can have a political process. But I really wanted you all to have a chance to have all this information so that you can make decisions based on things that are the actual facts of the information and ask your own questions yourself so that you have you, you can go forward informed. That's kind of the goal of the night. Okay? Yeah, and also because there's okay. like 10 slides, there's pictures mostly. I just want people to get an idea of you know, what the staff's been doing over the last 18 months. So this is the tool crib. Um, I'm just going to snap through them. You can see the floor afters. Our chemical story, our chemical story slash uh, addition room. The overall. It's kind of funny that the initials are the WWTS. <laughs> 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 that are working with our chemicals. Um, my father is a water treatment plant operator of 30 years mm -hmm. for the extra water treatment um, facilities. Yeah. And um, a lot of things that they um, have dealt with and stuff are the masks and the stuff for the chlorine or Absolutely. the different chemicals that they need to work with. Otherwise, that, that can affect lungs and stuff. And my father is actually dealing with something like that right now. Hold on. Okay. Um, do we have that safety I'll stuff? Hear that about the father. Uh, yes, yeah, so in our I, I did, when the commissioners came in, one of the first uh, POs that I presented with the new purchase order policy that was implemented was uh, the preventive maintenance gear, uh, excuse me, the protective maintenance gear that we need. With the breathing? Yeah, we, I, what I recommended was full face respirators, and, and we do have them at this point. We've got them, we've fit tested, um, we've got a program in place, so yes. We do have that. In the past, I will tell you that we didn't have a problem. Okay. Because that, that's a long-term effect that sure. it can affect the operators that work with the chemicals. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so as, what you see there is actually the reason the wall is so light is uh, uh, sodium bisulfite over the years is covered the wall. Right? And I washed it down, you know, floor to ceiling so you could actually see the paint again. But, you know, obviously the room needs to, uh, to be addressed. Um, but that's, another, that's another conversation. More 3D imaging, talking about the pump galley uh, that I'm recommending as highest priority on the wastewater side. Just gives you an idea of how confined that area is um, and, and what we're dealing with down there. Uh, definitely. Might I ask someone who see three staples in their forehead? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, so, there's a lot of low, low pipe work that you have to duck under to get the valve that we have to turn up really. So that right there is the, um, that's the plan for the upgrade. So, I mean, we're at this point now. We, we just need um, some support to be able to move forward so that we can implement the new pump gallery. Is there imminent issues with the pumps right now? Are they leaking downline? Yeah, we've got um, one of our uh, WAS pumps, which stands for Waste Activated Sludge. Uh, it really doesn't matter what it does for the conversation. It is leaking. Um, and Due to the fact that we were planning on a full overhaul down in the basement, you know, the decision that was made by myself and the past commission was we were going to defer all maintenance down there. We weren't going to bring new parts in because they are readily available. Um, but to do the rebuilds on them are anywhere from 12 to 
$4,800. So uh, we've held off on all that. So we're at a point now that we either have to purchase the equipment and rebuild these pumps because there, there is high potential for failure um, or continue on with the plant, which would be to, to do the uh, upgrade. Uh, um, this is just some, some information that we can get into after. Uh, but this just talks about you know all the uh, violations of the past that we've had. So one way or the other, we need to put some money into it. For sure, absolutely. Um, and then again, full history complaints. You can see um, stating back as far as 2015, um, and I've got records that go back to 2009, where the conversation started with Park Cross about adding polyethylphosphate to combat the corrosion issue that we. Can you just put that back one slide? And if I could make one comment from the regulatory side. All of those lines are violations. Before Ray came, there were repeated violations. Not the, the, the very first ones are arsenic because they were above the, the 10 parts per billion that, that we were implementing. So, and it just went on and on for, for quarters at a time. Then the benzene, that was a new well that came online for a few uh, violations. But a lot of the others were just missed samples that really did not need to be missed. So, so really the attention was just not there. Until Ray has been on uh, here for the past two years, it's a whole different culture. He's always available for, for whenever we call or email, immediately responds. He, uh, the commitment is just night and day. So I, I just wanted to say that, that, that since the past two years, it's a very different story. You know, did we except that violations happen at times that was told us a long time ago, we can't control it all, right? So I my standards are high. I don't want violations, but you know, they do happen and when they happen we make the adjustments needed so that they don't continue to happen. That's kind of my mentality. So and then again a little street. So but that's it, that wraps it up. Um, Joe, can you put the light back on please? Thank you. The way I'd like to proceed is, I'm sure there are people who came to and have a question, they're prepared to have a question. Uh, let's just do raise of hand and Ms. Heward. This is Ann Heward, a town resident and our water sewer district resident. I'm just curious about the relative size of our uh, water sewer district as compared to others in the state. I suspect it's small. How small is it? And for water, di water and sewer districts of this size, are, how have others, uh, other municipalities, coped to you know, keep the staff well paid, to, to have provide infrastructure improvements that are needed to run safely for all parties concerned? And do we have the, the, the are there other configurations? I know we have a separate water and sewer district. Just, just comments from them that we about how small we are and how. How we compare with how other districts of this size? The typically smaller towns are struggling because you don't have the tax base. Um, I, my career, I started in Nashville, worked with Nashville for 25 years, um, working my way up from being an operator one to managing the facility. Um, coming into these small towns because I do um, check on about 60 plants throughout the state. Some are small, some are lagoons. But typically, what we see is the uh, tax base you know, isn't quite, you know. Um, big enough to support what they really need, and th then we have funding from, from the state that can help out the towns. But um, typically, a small town because that's what you're going to find they're struggling with. How small are we? You know, the last um, no, five percent, ten percent size. It, from the plants that I've seen, I think uh, I there's probably like six large plants in the state. And most of them you know, are going to be where you guys are. It's a small community. Um, you guys had to mill. There was a reason why you had the, the treatment plant installed in the first place to treat that kind of lease. And a lot of times, this is what happens. The mills go away, but you're left with that infrastructure that you need to take care of. And you don't have that tax base because the mill is closed. So it's kind of, you know, it's a tough position to be in. But it doesn't mean that you can't do the right thing. There's ways around and get the money. It's like running your household. You can find a way, you know, you just need to ask. And that's what we're here for. And all that on the water side, you're about middle range because uh, we have a lot of, we have about um, 630 uh, small uh, community water systems in the state. We have 
One, Manchester Waterworks is our largest. The second largest is Panachuk National System. Everybody else is sort of, you know, the, the small municipalities. So, so we have uh, systems from 25 people to, to the 130,000 in Manchester. That's the range of water systems. And we all have to meet the same regulations. So if it, on the drinking water side, which is my side, you're about middle of the range, a small municipality. You have a good uh, a, a base of uh, residents and, and um, customers. And this is the planning. The, the number one uh, tool that you have is your asset management plan, which has just been completed by Ryan Pierce last year with a grant, 50% uh, grant from the state. And then you just follow the plan, as Ray was saying. You know, you can make it over, you know, there's immediate needs, what's highest priority, you need to be reviewing your rates on an annual basis. Last year you did review your rates, uh, compared it to other communities, so all that information is already uh, put together to have a good, a good plan to go forward. So we're not in a completely impossible situation. Well, not at all, not at all. You, you were in a very good position uh, to go forward, so you have all the tools. Thank you. Um, Jimmy Nelson, and I'm here uh, because I'm on the school board, and, and the school you mentioned right in, front of the, uh, right, right in the middle of sort of the, the problem area with uh, the delivery system, the cast iron cuts. Um, and I noticed that one of the reasons that it's number one, that area, was the second reason down was mortality. Are we talking about mortality of the system or the mortality system. of the system? <laughs> 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But mortality also means it could fail. Yeah. That's right. And um, so, and, and one other question. I, it, I can see from the, well, I can see a number of things from the slides. First of all, a lot of chemicals are going into the water. That's something that obviously has to happen because it can be tested when you pull it out. How often do you test it at the source, at the school, or at somebody's house? So we do, we do quarterly, um, quarterly bacteria samples, and that, that takes place at the town hall and the fire station. Right? So that's, we, Cindy and I discussed this a while back and, and have identified that that's really the two best places to give uh, a true indication of uh, the chlorine in the system. So that happens quarterly, uh, and when we do that, we're testing uh, the chlorine residual at that time, and then sending out the sample. But there are specific things in the in the in the, in the, in the Willie Street uh, area with the cast iron pipes that then are not being caught, for instance. All right. So so I guess the only other comment that I want to make is: at, Would you consider adding the school to your quarterly uh, testing? You actually, I think you do test more often at the school. The school is on our lead and copper testing, mm -hmm. so we test for lead and copper. At the school. But not asbestos. Any asbestos is coming through or anything like that. And the other thing I want to make, just for everyone who's listening, the cost of replacing that, that, that delivery system in that Lily Street area um, was $1.2 But if for any reason the school was out without water, it would be twice that to try to educate our students. Twice that a year. Not, 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 not one time, but twice that a year to take those 150 students the 200 people that would be affected if we have to close that school, it would be twice that every single year. And the school can't le legally operate without running right. water. Right, so I just, I just want to point that out. If people think this is too expensive, think about what it will cost if we have to, if, if something happens, that we have to close the school. I just want to make that clear. Uh, thank you. Emily Quark, Circle. Um, how old are the pipes in that area? So they range back. <laughs> So it's some it's some point between about there uh, to I think in the early fifties, depending on how the uh, progression of extensions end up happening. And what's the lifespan of those? Over. Cast iron mains can last a good long time. It, it, the, the the real issue there is, is it's online. So that's that tuberculation process. So you get basically corrosion coming from the inside of the pipe to the water chemistry. So uh, it, that's this buildup of this tuberculation. It was also if um, the water wasn't treated effectively uh, for if there was iron getting pushed out of the source, uh, you can get metals deposition in the pipes as well. 
So, um, and if that sediment gets stirred up because some water moves by a little faster, that's when you end up with uh, discarded water potentially in your house. So, um, so it, whether it's a replacement or a lining, uh, at the end of the day, getting coating those pipes or replacing them with a pipe that doesn't have is metallic metal against water mm -hmm. is the uh, is is important. Denise, um, Denise Knowles from Silver Street. I want to know how concerned the residents of the district should feel about um, the increased usage of the portal well bringing arsenic into the system. I know that's been demanded that it's being done that way. How so, should we feel about that? To step back, just so the, the demand of running the border um, is it being upheld. We're not running border right now due to the direction of the commissioners. The reason I'm running border five days a week right now is due to uh, the, the corrosion control study that was performed last year by Wright Pierce and the information that we received out of that study. So what we found was um, the two sources um, were drastically different in terms of chemistry. So they're both perfectly fine, but the differences in, in the water chemistry create that perfect storm when they mix. So when they mix, it causes the potential for high, you know, high corrosion. Um, and going through the process and understanding that, what we determined uh, in discussing with, with Cindy, with discussion with, um, with Chris Berg and his team, was if we're going to run water, we want to run it as much as possible. The reason why the integration and the controls of the quarter are very important. If we can get quarter to run 24 7 like General does, then we have a consistent blend of water at all times. So we're not getting that, you know, Monday morning when I start quarter back up because it's sat stagnant over the weekend, we get that clash again. And that's that's shown to be the issue right now. Um, so, yeah, and I will you know, comment on the arsenic because that, you know, in terms of arsenic right now, um, the system is, is, in my opinion, and I think uh, Cindy can attest to this, um, we've maximized the potential for treatment there. We're not, we've got four quarters of non detector iron sampling. We, the last two quarters we've had detectable limits, um, but I pulled the samples later in the run time to see how much time I get before I start seeing that breakthrough again, before you backwash. So I'm collecting that data, and even with a full day of running, we're still meeting the, the new standard that's going to come up, which is five, um, with MTL five. So we're still meeting that. The highest I've seen is five since we made the changes to the system. So I don't be concerned that the water is completely rough. Those days are gone right now, and we're, the process that is in place up there is it's micromanaged. So when it's operating, we're testing uh, on the out uh, to check the certain parameters to make sure that the process is running properly so that we can get the water coming out of the other side is, is arsenic free or as low well as possible. Right. To, to add to that, one thing that we want to consider though, um, the, the media in um, the, the arsenic removal system hasn't been changed in 10 years. So that's our next big push up there is to start thinking about the media change. Because I truly think with the with the parameters that are put in place right now, with some fresh media, I think we're going to be, you know, we'll be doing even better. You know, we're doing better. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say that that you have the correct treatment system. It took those early violations back in 2006 was because you were using a little bit a different treatment system, and you finally settled on this what you have now, which is with the chemical feed. But with uh, Ray's work over the past few years, he's been able to fine tune that with, you know, we've been troubleshooting and, and working together very closely so that you're now meeting really the, the new MCL, which is five. So you're, you're less than half, you're in great shape. And this is the same process that other uh, large municipalities, like Seabrook, Exeter, uh, groundwater plant, a uh, new market is going to be building a similar one. So this is the right technology to have for a municipal system like yours. And the, the controls that that, uh, that Ray showed you with Jafinity, that's Ray meter, this pH control, this flow pacing, all of that is an integral part. It takes a lot of labor because he doesn't have the instrumentation. But that's the, that is the, the right, uh, you can purchase the pH meter at both units so that we, he can control those and all that. So that's working great. 
we're very happy to, to report that we've been able to fix that. And that's pretty much the first time since the, the system was installed. That it's actually been controlled and, and into place. And that's because we've never had a superintendent stay here long enough, uh, or year enough, to, to, to do it right. So kudos to Ray. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a complex system, and there's been a lot of uh, information gathered by Cindy. And thank God, I mean, Cindy, but, you know, mentored me through the process because we didn't have the data available to figure it out. So with Cindy's direction, we were able to, you know, with me turn on my listening ears and paying attention and implementing, you know, what the professional was suggesting, um, we were able to get to the proper treatment. And I also want to give a kudos to Dr. Malley, UNH, because a lot of help Absolutely. also on the water quality. So he's an expert in, in uh, water treatment as well. So my go-to person always. Yeah. Uh, so we had the, the luxury of having his help and, and some of the students help us last year yeah, we as did. well and a lot, of, a lot of those things. So we're really happy to report all that progress in the past few years. You had four in charge, I believe, at one point? Yeah, four and then a total of six. Um, Cindy and I have a, a friendship. She was one of our students. So the university uh, donates uh, students every summer to some communities. And I should brag about my three cats. I'm going to embarrass you. Molly, Emma, and Steve. Uh, this year they're in Exeter and Seabrook. Um, so it didn't cost the town anything. That's really important to underscore. And what we try to do is bring Cindy the, the world experience that I happen to have. So, so um, and I think it's really important to understand the Wiley Road. And I, I'd like you to think of it. Imagine I paint half the wall white and half the wall black. That's your two wells. And unfortunately, then I take the middle of those and I mix the paints and I get this ugly gray mess. And that's what happens when your water sloshes back and forth through the Wiley Road, unfortunately. We showed that really clearly. In fact, we're a little proud of the fact when we met you all and started with you, you were clearly in lead violation, and we, as a team, yes. Ray listening, which is special, and <laughs> a lot of people don't listen to professors, right, Holly? <laughs> and Emma and Cassidy. Um, but he listened and he did what we all said, and we were totally clean by the end of the yeah. process. I was really proud of that. Awesome. So anyway, I, I won't talk anymore. But, no, <laughs> but we're glad to help. And uh, as I say, this year we're in Exeter and Seabrook mm -hmm. and Nova. So. And just to add to that, we 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 were able to, to meet Dolly, Dr. Malley through you know. Cindy was the bridge to that. She she so sent my information to Dr. Malley, um, and he had a student that was interested in small communities that was struggling with lead and copper. So uh, ultimately, Jalissa chose our community and the start of the line, and we had a great summer of, of uh, learning a ton about our system. Mm -hmm. and our little blue flags all over the town. little blue flags. Yeah. In, in case in case you still see a little blue flag, yeah. <laughs> that was you and H. Right. <laughs> Yes, Lorraine Hansen. I don't live in the water district, and I have some questions about capacity. And I was wondering, um, I live on, I have a well at my house, and I was thinking that I'd like to know about the aquifers that feed the wells that the town uses, because I'd like to know what's the residual capacity of the wells and the town water system, and also how would that affect other people outside of the water district if you had to run at capacity and, and would you be pulling from our aquifers? I just need to know some of those questions. I think I can answer that. Uh, so when we permit a well, which we, we just permitted, um, I think it was last year or two years ago, we permitted a replacement well for General Sullivan. When, when the state permits a well, we do a, an extended pumping test, which evaluates any impact on surrounding wells up to a 1,000 foot radius. Uh, so that the maximum permitted uh, capacity is that which does not impact anybody else. So what, is, what they are allowed to, to pump out of that well is the, the sustainable yield. That's it. And that's what you have at General Sullivan. At uh, Porterhouse, you have two wells. Uh, a replacement well for one of those wells that, that was, uh, and, and uh, bedrock wells tend to decline in yield uh, over time. That's the nature of, of a bedrock well. So one of those wells was replaced, I think we, it was 2006, no, what was that, 2013 maybe? So that one's older, so the, the replacement well and the original well. So there's two wells at quarter, and those are pumping fine, they have adequate capacity. 
So you could expand, uh, actually, if, you know, so the, in terms of source capacity, you're in good shape. Which you can't say for everything. <laughs> One more question about that. When you're saying source capacity, how about, you know, what's the residual capacity of all the wells if you were to, say, double the size of the water district or double the number of customers or how many more customers yeah, can you so add? So any time that a system is going to expand, you need to obtain state approval and that's part of the evaluation. If, if you were all of a sudden going to double the, your uh, service community, maybe, maybe connect with a with another town or extend into the rest of the town for, uh, to serve uh, private wells, for example, then we would evaluate what is the capacity of these wells. Again, you would have to do a pumping test if, you, if they would support a higher uh, uh, withdrawal rate, or you would permit a new source. Or another way that we, that we augment capacity is connecting with other towns so, as well. So uh, Summers would, Berwick, Maine, uh, you know, some of these interconnections not only serve, can, can provide a supplement of capacity, but also emergency uh, connections for, for, for... The reason I was asking on that part is I understand that there's a development being considered tomorrow night for nine houses on Silver Street. And we also have apartments in the Bluen building that will be going online pretty soon. And I don't know whether that will have any impact or how much of an impact it will have on our system. Yeah, and that's part of this, the state's review of, of the expansion. So I think for those communities, uh, they might need to do, uh, the pressure might, it, quantity is there, but the pressure is not, and so they may need to do a booster station as one of the things that might be needed. Um, I'm Hannah Goodrow. I just moved to Rockford a week ago. Welcome home. <laughs> um, we're excited to live here, but... Um, I just have a general question. Is it safe to drink out of my faucet? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. water is tested and it's safe. But if I can throw out, I say the same thing in my house and I have a well, it really makes sense to run it for a while. Yeah. It just does. I've been Running in water cold. 40 years. Yeah. Would you agree, Cindy? Yeah. Just, just flush it till you feel the cold or so, like a baby bottle. Yeah, because some of my neighbors say we let it run for a little bit. Or yeah, it like, just makes sense. Or, okay. We do that in our well. You yeah. know, I think it's just good no matter what town you live in, yeah. frankly. You know. It tastes better. It's cool. Other questions? Mike Robinson. I'm a resident at Willie Street. Uh, I know there's been a lot of information flying around, and I know, no disrespect to you specialists, I, I just don't scoop water and water ma management. But, uh, Ray, I feel as though since you've come, been, you know, come on in the district, it's, it's made, we've seen someone trying to get results for us, which we appreciate. Thank you. And, you know, from the panel of people and the relationship that you have, it's obvious that you're not afraid to ask for help. But I feel like you're the one that's been putting the pieces together for us over the years. And I know in the conversations we've had, it seemed like prior to the spring, this spring, you had kind of a vision for how to address Willie Street and given the, the different uh, programs that are in place in the state and uh, just some different things that we had to do. Can, do you mind kind of summarizing some of that or articulating to Frank? I don't know if you were part of that yeah, vision sure. as well. Frank was the leader of the vision. I mean, the reason why we were able to make the progress was the support, right, from up above. So um, all the concerns that were brought forward, right, my first monthly meeting as a superintendent was with the Willie Street customers in bottles of brown water. Um, and it got my attention real quick, right? So um, as it was a slow progression to get to see some results, I know we're not there yet, um, the vision became, it, it shifted gears once, right? We did the ice picking. Uh, the ice picking didn't prove to really give us a whole lot of relief. It was two months later, I think, we started having a lot of quality issues again. So um, the next step after that was to install the low flushing hydrant at, at the culvert so that we had a point to release that build up that we couldn't get uh, with the velocity of, you know, across really because it's, it just can't get it with the low spot. So, we installed that, and that has helped um, to be able to relieve the color that's sitting there. And we also replaced the hydrant in front of the school so that we had a better hydrant. It's a little taller. And the goal was to put an automatic flushing hydrant there that would trigger off at night. But we found that the neighbor near the hydrant was starting to see some moisture in his basement from the amount of water dropping on the ground. So we had to bail on that. 
and we're not able to put it at the low point because there's wetlands right there, and we have to deflor, and it becomes a real complicated topic to, to just discharge there every night. That would be the best scenario um, for the for for a band-aid, right? These are all band-aids that I'm talking about. Right? You know, these are options so that we can provide better quality water until we get to the real solution, was which was going to be a replacement. Because we did look down the avenue of lining the pipe uh, with Suez, and there are other products out. Chris has tipped me off on this. I, I started with Suez, got the price back, and it was astronomical. I mean, it was going to be equal or not. It was going to it was going to be more than a traditional uh, traditional replacement of the pipe. So that's when the ice pig came in, right? We, we decided to do the ice pig, and then the topic changed. Instead of waiting the three years like we discussed at that first meeting, or it might have been the second meeting we all had, um, the decision was, okay, we're going to get involved with the asset management study. We were, fit, we, were getting, we were finishing up the corrosion control study, so we were starting to kind of put the picture together, and it wasn't, it wasn't good. I mean, it was, like Dr. Malley said, we identified by tracking our alkalinity, we know exactly where Port Wells water goes, and we know now that the mix is happening right there. So, you know, just flushing isn't the option there. It's, it's a temporary leak. Um, but the next step was now looking at doing the asset management grant, and once we finalize that, we're going to start moving towards looking for funding. Right? So once, once we had the, the, the study in the picture, we were going to go after um, the state revolving fund to start. Um, there's no guarantees that we were going to get it. Actually, now that now that I know what happened this year, Chris and I talked about it, chances are we weren't going to that. There's a lot of competition in that arena right now because of the PFAS conversation. There's new contaminant levels that have been introduced and there's a lot of community struggling. So there was a ton of money requested, way more than you know, and a lot of it went to, correct me, I could be a little off base here, but a lot of it went to those types of communities. So, we probably would not have got the funding, but it would have set the stage to start moving towards the next round of funding, which um, there's uh, there's also the state trust fund, um, and it sets you up and puts you in a really good shape. It puts you in good shape if you've already applied for the, the state's funds, and you get denied, and I move through that. And then if that doesn't work out, you know, there's other options. And you just keep, you got to keep going until you find funding, but there is funding available. Um, it's best to... So that was the goal, right? We're going to go after the funding for the replacement. We, we short term talked about the cost, right? The whole Lily Street local prospect. Because for me, that was that was I was shooting for the stars. That's what I wanted to see happen. I wanted to see all that taken out to just you know, to, to get this problem over with. But this is the reality of that, right? So we were going to look at in 20, uh, you know, hopefully have funding. 2020. 2020 have funding in place so that we would see substantial completion of the Willie Street replacement um, by the end of 2021. So you don't start paying these loans back for substantial completion. So we would have had some offset uh, before we started paying back. And we've got another bond that's on uh, that's going to drop off almost around the same time. So and that bond carries the cost uh, monthly cost. It's almost identical to the cost of this Willie Street project. So the, the goal was to try and time it so that we could do the Willie Street project and really not affect rates with that. But we were finding there are so many other issues that need to be addressed that, you know, unfortunately, you know, going further down this rabbit hole, you know, we, we, we um, you know, unveiled, right, uh, the, the need for other issues, uh, other, other replacements. Um, but to sum it up, I think that, I, think, I hope I hit your question, Mike, right? yeah. um, but that was the goal that was in place, and that's what we were moving for. Yeah, and I know, I know just last year, like, you had made an effort to start trying to increase rates, I think, with the commissioner's help, you know, just, we were on a path to start putting some money aside into a, a, a capital improvement right. fund or right. something. I'll, I'll put a little bit on that. Um, we knew that we had to increase rate, rates because what had happened was, there was a budget, call it six hundred thousand dollars, about three hundred for water, three hundred for sewer. It was the same for the last four or five years. I came in four years ago. And when it came to be budget time, there was no discussion about the budget. It was going to be the same budget next year, and next year, and next year. It was never going to go up. Um, the engineering reports from two different sources said that. We would not be sustainable um, if we didn't do something. The report from the auditor said 
you either have to spend less money or you have to um, raise rates. So the, the writing was on the wall. The people that were in place just didn't want to raise the rates. Um, so year one, I listened. Year two, I asked questions. Year three, I got the other commissioners to vote um, on some really hard subjects. In, in year three, um, we had we, we needed a superintendent. We've gone through four of them in like five years. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the state should tell us what that does when we go through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, it's not helpful from the least part of the I mean, you know, water is very intensive. Uh, it's, it's hard to run, and then a wastewater plant has a lot more moving parts. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, having somebody come in and learn that curve and run the plants, and it, it takes you a while. Ray, you, when, when you first came on board, I was here. I'm like, I, you know, I'm here to help. Just let me know what you need. And then I said, as you get into this, you're going to start learning the plant. That's how it works. After about a year, you may feel somewhat comfortable. After two years, you're feeling a little bit more. In my experience, having training operators, about five years, five or six years, you start feeling, you know, you get that comfort level, you know, something comes up, I haven't seen it before, but it's an anomaly. So it takes that long. So having people come in and out of the door every couple of years, you're not going to get any consistent process out of that. You're going to have somebody who's going to come in and go back with a guy, he's going to have to learn a whole new plant, he's going to have to learn all the equipment, and then he leaves, and then you get somebody else in the door. So that's not going to help you run the plan efficiently by having people come in and out the door. So that's what I'll say to that. Yeah. You know, one thing, I think the plan was upgraded, what, 14, 15 years ago. I think the mindset of at least the, the commissions at the time, that if we redid the plan, we never have to do it again. That's not the case at all. I mean, this is an ongoing process. Not only that, to redo it, but to keep it up. So that, that's a good point. So so when I came in, I, I, you know, I said, well, what do I have to bring to the table? Um, my background is engineering, um, My and, and I had 30 plus years of manufacturing and experience and whatnot. Um, so I thought I could come in and help them with this 14-year-old plant that they think is going to last 50 years, but really will last 20 or 25. So, um, the other um, commissioners, um, you know, asked me to come in, and they, they said, you know, we've got a superintendent that doesn't, you know, want to do anything. He's not here, and we don't, you know, just the regular stuff that's been going on in Wallingsburg. Um, the commission, the, the superintendents would have other jobs during the day. They were landscaping or whatever, but they were the superintendents um, running the plant. So there wasn't a, a finger looking at them. So um, when I came in, I, they asked me to really push on the superintendent, I'm not going to use any names that was there at the time. So, um, you know, there was a, a, a rotor, um, a, a ditch motor that had never been ma maintained. And, you know, my question, and, you know, it's, it's offline. So I said, well, while it's offline, why don't we do some maintenance to it? Well, he wanted to replace it for, I don't know, $5,000. And I said, well, it's about $150 if we do it in-house. So we did it in house. It was like, you know, it was impossible to. It was very difficult to get him to do it, but he did do it. Um, but shortly after he quit, um, because I was putting pressure on him, and at that point, that's when the super, that's when the commissioner sat down and said, "Hey, we need to get somebody good. We need to get somebody that wants to be here long term, and it, it, it's time. We're, you know, the state's gonna." I guess the state can take over, right? Well, yeah, you know, I'm going to go back to the staffing issue right now. Ray's the only, the only qualified operator to have. He doesn't have a backup operator because you lost, I lost one of your operators yep. just recently to uh, another plant. So Ray is it. And uh, how long can you carry that on all by yourself? With, uh, you know, help he's doing the water, he's doing the wastewater, he's doing all the maintenance on both. Uh, he's going to burn out. Ray's quick. only got one. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've got one operator, but one. he's in the process of being trained. That's right. With us for a year, he had water experience, Tom, and uh, he's doing a fantastic job. But like John said, there's there's a learning curve. Sure. It takes time to get up to speed to the point that you know you don't have to be um, checked on and, and make sure that numbers are actually getting in accurately. Um, so yeah, so there's we're, we're working with that one. So you know you're trying to run the plant, trying to maintain it, you're training an operator. 
I mean, you have a lot of fun on your plate. You know? I'm super fortunate. I'm going to plug Kate Preston. She's our clerk. She has stepped up to replace with me. She's actually, I've trained her on the wastewater side, and she's acting as a temporary operator for me right now. If I had the boat right now, she would be the hire. She wants to do it. She understands it. And she's, she's very intelligent, and she's picked it up in a month. And she's given me support. I'm sure that I can help do these other right here. Um, I'm just curious, what is the role of the state? Um, we all know that things aren't going well, you know, politically here, and um, if things were to really fall apart, and, you know, our water, things were not getting done, and, you know, rain quit, or ah! got fired, or, you know, something like that, with the state, is there a point where the state intercedes, and takes some control over this is so what you know, we would do would, we would be issuing enforcement and actually the, the current commissioners asked that are we under any enforcement right now are is the state issuing fines and the answer is no right now you're not under enforcement you came into compliance so we're not if you lost your operator uh, you we would issue a violation because we need to have an operator every day uh, attending to the system for wastewater you need a backup operator right now you don't have a backup Operator, so that so that's an issue. Uh, but the only we wouldn't the state wouldn't doesn't doesn't have any interest in operating uh, your water and wastewater facility. But the town can step in and so in other towns uh, the district has been dissolved and the, the select board uh, can vote. Uh, I, I don't know that process and maybe Carolyn can, can explain, but uh, you can dissolve the district and the town could take over the management of the. But the town would have to choose to do that. The right? mm -hmm. town would not be imposed by right. the state. Right. We would we would issue violations and fines so that until until we change. Well, the town and the district would have to vote for that to happen. Right. But if it gets bad enough that the the state can issue an AL, right? Which oh, yeah. comes at how much? How many thousand dollars a day? Those are fines. Uh, uh, at least the drinking water ones, I'm not sure the wastewater ones, it's $2,000 a day per fine, per violation. And once you're in violation, you know, those rack up very much. But, you know, okay. per violation. Really, that's not a place where we want to be, no, no, ever, because oh, there were, we all, our goal is to provide safe drinking water and proper uh, wastewater treatment. So, really, we work very hard with communities, with all communities not to be issued fines, but we do have that option as a last resort. I may be mixing the acronym up, but how does the town do with PCFs right now? Because I know that's a hot, PFAS, that's, that's a hot topic among the state right now, and, and how do we monitor that? We're coming up this quarter, I'm due to monitor. It's the first time, so I have no results yet. So at the end of quarter three, I'll have the results, and then we'll, we'll set a plan accordingly. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. And we just talked about this during the sanitary survey. Uh, myself, uh, Cindy, and, um, and Rick Durant, and so, yeah, the PFAS is a, it's a big topic, and it, we don't know because we don't have any records or data, so it, it could be a major issue, and it may not. Sure. So we'll find out. Uh, yeah, we'll Great, thank you. Yeah, you will. So New Hampshire just adopted the, the PFAS uh, standards, and what that means is that starting a uh, uh, this year, end of this year, all the water systems will be monitoring. Uh, the baseline will be four consecutive quarters of monitoring. And if after those four consecutive quarters, it will establish what needs to be done. If, if any levels are above, then treatment would be, would be needed, or perhaps a different blending strategy uh, would be needed. Or if not, if they're low, then you would get reduced monitoring for the future. So that's, that's just going to start at the end of this year. So it's a monitoring system being set into place, per se. First, yeah, first we do monitoring for fourth quarters, and then, and then uh, issues, then the actions will be taken. The exception to that is if levels are very high, that you're above the, that you're four times the, the uh, standard, then it would have to be soon. But other than that, it will just be four quarters of monitoring to establish the baseline. For those of us who don't know the acronym, could you give a little more of an 
explanation of what you're going to be testing for. We'll let Cindy do that. You've got to be a linguist to get that one out. Sure. So, um, and it's probably the hottest topic in water in the, in the country. Um, we all grew up with things we loved uh, Teflon, Gore-Tex, uh, waterproof boots. So, the chemicals used in there are a whole category called fluorinated, so F is fluorine, organics. Uh, and there are, we think, 4,500 of them total. We know how to measure 14 as a nation, so the screening that's likely going to happen, and I know Chris's firm is doing a lot of these, we're doing some. You start looking for these fluorinated organic compounds. Now, locally, of course, peas and Merrimack, due to uh, St. Gobain plastics, sort of made the news because the um, materials were found in both places. It used to be the firefighting foam for all the military. So we have thousands of sites around the country. And so first thing, we find out what's there, at what levels. And the other thing that's really tough for us as engineers is we're talking now parts per trillion. Mm. So it is so unbelievably infinitesimal that mm. you know people talk about you know, one beer at Fenway Park is roughly a parts per trillion, if you can imagine <laughs> dumping that in a, in a stadium. So it's going to probably be there at some teensy level. And then we have to decide, as Cindy just said, is it anywhere near the so-called regulation? You know, um, God forbid it's four times the regulation. We may have to take certain actions. Um, New Hampshire's quite in the lead on this, in part thanks for testing for peas, those brave women who started that. Uh, they're sort of our heroes, if you will. They actually come and speak in our classes. Um, so that's what it is. It's a lot of compounds. Uh, uh, you know, probability of Rollins for having it is hard to guess. We don't have any, you know, any idea. Being an old mill town, maybe, you know. Um, but yeah, it's probably the hottest topic in our, in our water world right now. Uh, Suzanne Hewitt, um, I noted when you were talking about the water treatment for the General John Sullivan well, that I think you were treating with disinfectant, is that what I get? So what is the nature of that? Is that normal? Is it worrisome? Or, you know? Well, almost talk about chlorine. I don't know if you want to say what I can talk about. So, so we use chlorine. We love chlorine in drinking water. Yeah. Is the reality because chlorine uh, allows us to maintain uh, the sanitary conditions and the piping, and that's why we keep it. We like to have a residual of chlorine. So it's standard. So oh, it's yeah. standard. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. standard. It's not required for a well water such as yours. Uh, it is required uh, a disinfection for surface water, so the reservoirs and, and, and lakes. Mm -hmm. They have to hold the water for a certain period of time in order to get certain disinfection. Groundwaters in New Hampshire do not need to do that disinfection. But we like it because it keeps acceptable the bacteria absent and it, it's uh, throughout the piping. So that's why we add chlorine. In the case of Porter Well House, chlorine is also providing the important oxidation because it's a very strong oxidant. So we add it to, to, uh, to remove the arsenic and, and uh, we add iron and to, bring down, to, uh, to bring down the arsenic and we need the chlorine to, to do that process also. So it's, it's a dual function in Porter. Hi, Allie Gray and Kevin Gray. We're actually going to be rolling for residents in about three weeks. Uh, we are moving to Silver Street and a new construction. To be honest, I've actually never even tasted the Rollinsburg water. I have no idea anything about how it is. Um, but I read that, uh, speaking of the chlorine, that there is a lot of chlorine in the water uh, in reference to the same amount as in a swimming pool. Um, I'm not sure if that could possibly be true, if that's healthy. Uh, I'd like to know like what if, if people are using like in-home water filtration systems um, to counteract any of these issues that people are having. Like I'm a little nervous also to drink the water and have my family drink the water. And so um, you know, I just don't know if that's something that you would recommend for someone that you know, we don't even have water running in our house yet, but is that something that we should just get built in, excuse me, built in from the beginning, or 
like is the amount of chlorine that's in the water safe to drink? Does it smell chlorine? Does it smell like a pool when it's coming out of a faucet? I can start there. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just say something real quick? I actually live on Silver Street. And it doesn't smell like a pool, and it doesn't okay. taste like a pool. Okay. Did anyone see that? That someone well, was saying we, that it was you know, people. It's little, true. I and I, and I and totally. And that's sad. that was my only reference. Yeah. That's why I wanted. Yeah. But I, was, I mean, the complaint I would have is we have very bad water pressure. Pressure. The pressure is too bad. Oh. So I'm a little concerned about that development going on the end because we had a couple more there, and next thing you know, I'm I'm showering like. <laughs> drops of water you know, in my shower. Um, but no, that, that is a little bit of an exaggeration, and I live on Fulton So go ahead, try it. Yeah, but to answer, so being new to a, I don't, we want well water before. We've only done yeah. well. Yeah, so you're going to be sensitive to it, right? Until you get used to the chlorine, um, it's probably going to smell highly chlorinated to you. What I can tell you is that we, um, we test very closely for multiple residuals in our system daily. Um, chlorine is one of them, and my goal is to maintain leaving the wells 1.5 milligrams per liter, and that's well below the recommended level, well below the, the maximum, thank you, maximum level. Um, but we have five actually brought it down from where it was when I started. It was in the mid twos, um, and I, I tested them. Uh, there's a few different ways that I mm -hmm. test it. That's an underlying test that I run to see what the residual is out all the way out in the you got to have residual at the end because it's disinfection, right? So I've got it fine-tuned to the point where my very far end point is getting a residual just about like a point three, And I can't come down any further than that because that far reach is going to be, you know, there's a potential for just, you know, not having the proper disinfection. Right. So I've got it dialed in as, as tight as I can, and we do monitor data. So I can assure you, if, if you have a high chlorine smell, you can call in, and I'd be more than happy to come to your home, and we can take a sample there and see what's going on. Um, but there sh shouldn't be at that level. I, I would say that some people are more sensitive to the smell of chlorine than others. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know if you, if you guys want to weigh in on that. But. You did have another question that's sort of one of my soapbox issues. Um, so, a lot of folks are afraid, right? I read in your paper that your water smells like blood. Um, that usually means what, iron, by the way, but a lot of people are afraid and fear cells, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. this idea, should we put a treatment uh, where the water enters our home, which we call point of entry, or should we put it on our tap, which is point of use? I always worry when folks do that because I ask in your crazy busy life, are you going to remember to maintain it? Are you going to remember to change it out when you're supposed to? Uh, our survey suggests that you're going to get busy and you're not. And so this device now becomes your worst enemy because it is collecting, 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 and once it's beyond its life, it drops it into your water. So before you become your own water treatment plant operator by having point of entry, point of use, somebody in the family's got to be the drill sergeant and really replace it every 180 days or every 20,000 gallons or whatever because you're really taking on a role that may or may not be what you want to do, like how often have you replaced the air filters in your forced hot air furnace or how often have you done the things you're supposed to do. So I worry about point of entry, point of use, even though right now fear is selling that around the country, of course, that people are putting it in. Um, just I worry about that. Um, chlorine in general is good. Our, our, you know, I know PFAS, every year of my career there's been a scare chemical, but we still worry about the originals, virus and getting sick to your stomach from bacteria. So as Cindy said, we still really like chlorine, believe it or not, <laughs> for the original days when it got rid of cholera and typhoid and hepatitis. So I just ask you to try and balance risk and uh, MDs will tell you never look on WebMD. I'm going to tell you never look on the internet. <laughs> That's all I can say. Because it's there to scare the heck out of you. Well, one other thing I'd like to mention is that um, before Ray came in, um, there were some discussions about when the, when the wells are running and we're adding chemical. We had chemical feeders that would just add the same amount of chemical based on time. 
not based on how much was being pumped out of the well. And when you're pumping against a tank that's full versus you're pumping against a tank that's 20 feet lower, you're pumping less water through. Mm -hmm. So well, one big thing that we did do, and I think it's, is it completed everywhere, flow pacing? Uh, flow pacing is completed, General. It's not completed at board. We don't have the, we don't have the, we don't have the truck up there yet. Mm -hmm. that. So, um, but that's part of the upgrade report. That is part of the upgrade, yeah. And as was mentioned earlier, it's always a good idea every morning you flush your tap because you want fresh water. You don't want to drink the water that's stacked overnight in, in, your, in your piping uh, for many reasons, but uh, most importantly for lead because our taps still have lead. Up to 2014, we had, uh, it was perfectly okay. That was our lead free definition up to 2014, it was 8% lead. And when your water sits in the pipe, you could be leaching a little bit of lead. So you don't want to drink that first flush. When we test it, we test that first flush, but just as a worst case scenario. So your regular practice every morning, or you, you fill up the coffee pot the night before after you do the dishes, or what I usually say is, you have our permission to leave the dishes for the morning. You do the dishes in the morning, and that way you flush the water, don't waste any water, but then you use the water. And how long a flush are you talking? Are you talking really, a minute? Until it, you, uh, a minute or so until you can feel the temperature change. Usually yeah. you can feel yeah. a little cooler. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's drastic. drastic. That's It'll just a good idea. idea. Yeah. It's a drastic temperature change. There, there is a definite temperature change. Yeah, if you, okay. if you're getting the water from the main, it's cooler. Yeah. The other thing I would like to throw out, which is very good for folks to hear, we're not responsible any of us for your premise plumbing decisions, you decide on that. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're getting a beautiful new kitchen or a beautiful new bathroom, <coughs> and you go on Amazon and you found these gorgeous fixtures, and they're 80% lead metal, which they might be if they happen to be coming from overseas. That's your problem, sadly. Now we do add chemicals, we do try to help protect your so-called premise plumbing. But in reality, and I know it's hard for the public to hear this, from the meter box to your tap is up to the public to make decisions. And cheap fixtures has been a huge headache for our, for our profession because of lead. So I throw out to you, be real careful. And that's another great reason for Cindy's advice. Open up that faucet, let it run till it's cold, because your beautiful mock Kohler fixture might be, <laughs> might be from South Korea, and it might not be as healthy as we wish. I just want to throw that out. Thank you. We have, we, 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 have, we, just, we just have a couple minutes until 8 o'clock, so we're going to take your question yeah. about chlorine, and then I want to kind of have a, a wrap-up. And um, if people want to stay after and talk, that's fine. I'm going to keep the library open if you want. Um, but I do think that for our guests, we want to try to keep it on the time that we have them committed to be here this evening. So go ahead next. Question. In terms of the chlorine, how much chlorine is safe to drink? Uh, there's a maximum residual level of four milligrams, but as, as this was mentioned, uh, yours is one and a half. Uh, you really just want to have enough chlorine in the system so that it's protected all the way to the end of the, of the pipe. So if one and a half leaving the plant is what he needs to reach a, a 0.2 or 0.3 at the end, that's what, what it would be. But a lot of communities uh, would easily go up to two and a half. Depending on the size of the community and, and, uh, and your raw water, you might sometimes need to add more. But the, but the maximum level is four. At that level, you would smell it. And so you know, that's kind of self so uh, Well, one of the really important things that we have had in the last two years is somebody actually watching all this and monitoring it and gathering the information and proactively addressing things and available for you to call them. And it has not always been that way in our community with the people managing the water district. So these times that we're in and the situation that we're in, this level of quality, this relationship that our current superintendent has with all these experts that we're willing to come tonight and speak to all of you is in jeopardy. And that is a really important part of why we did this tonight as well. And we in the district, who are the voters that control these things, need to be more vocal about what we expect and, and what we want to see happen in the community. Because we could go right back to where you, you said, uh, Frank, the chlorine just went out at a 
on sheet, right? It's just like a seven on foot. No, well, that's the, that's the old technology. Right. We, and that, we and weren't monitoring the degree that we are now uh, the different things that are in the water. And a, and a point to make is, and correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that part of what we voted for but isn't getting done? Yeah, the Warren articles for both golf sites are to improve even further. General Solid has been improved drastically, but to take that to the next level uh, with the, you know online water monitoring so that we can more, you know, we can guarantee the quality of water leaving. Uh, and if it, if it falls out of the parameters that are set, it would alarm me so that I know there's an issue. And we're also studying things proactively so that we can make smart decisions before We've kicked the can down the road for 15 years, and we're stuck with things that cost 30 times more to fix than if we took care of them immediately in the moment. In-house? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Luckily. Is that one okay. article available like in the town records? Or? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it would be in the minutes of the, um, would Kate, would you be able to post the minutes of the um, meeting, the uh, annual meeting? Definitely. Do you also want it was to presented. Everything? It was presented at with but the budget that we presented to everyone when we came to the meeting, it was presented right there. There's a budget, and then there were the Warren articles, and then there were the short articles. So they were separate, and they were mentioned. Uh, uh, give me like a day. Could you, could you leave, post it, and then could, could you possibly leave a copy in the library so that people could come down and take a look at it in the library, just print a copy of it? Oh, sure. Okay, that'd be great. Would that be good for you? Okay, great. Um, if anybody wants documentation, feel free to come to the plan. I just want to share that there is a um, active petition um, that was started to collect uh, signatures from water and sewer district members um, to help start to get the engineering report moving for Willing Prospect and Locust. Um, to have a survey done of the income, because right now, as Ray was talking about, a lot of those funding sources are based on the actual average income of Rollinsburg, the total town, um, and the village district tends to have a lower um, average income, which would help us get better rates on some of these loans or funding sources. Um, also, to um, look at that instrumentation that Ray has been talking about for Porter Well, um, and then to work through a discharge line for the Lily Street Flushing Hydrant. So the plan, the hope is to get enough signatures to get this in front of the commissioners to have a meaningful conversation um, and help to influence moving that forward because we've not been able to move it forward thus far. Well, if we voted on it, and we said we want it. Why do we need a petition <laughs> to really get them to do it? I, I'm just, I'm missing the Can I, can I like to say something to that as a former member of the select board? It is, in fact, the board of commissioners for the water and sewer district, because it is for the select board's prerogative to choose not to, not to execute a Warren article that the voters have voted on. You know, it's happened in the town before, you know, the contract didn't come in as expected or whatever the project is. I'm not, I'm not, not saying it's a good thing, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it's generally the commissioners have the authority to not execute a warrant article. That doesn't mean that residents of the town, or in this case residents of the water and sewer district, shouldn't be asking them if they want to why they haven't. So that is absolutely so something you can do. So the petition is a, is a good thing to do. But that's why it's it may be necessary because they can in fact choose not to. It actually puts it in front that enough people are wanting to uh, address this further yes. versus having a couple people in charge of what they think is what's best versus what the group wants as a whole. Can I just clarify that the Warren articles were for the for the improvements of uh, at General Sullivan and Porter, the instrumentation and those things? The uh, the income survey is is is, a, is, a, is not in part part of the uh, and and that doesn't cost the, the district anything because actually that's a third party that does that uh, uh, with their own funding but but so, so there's more to the what you more more actions that that you could ask to, to proceed on like the income survey and pursuing funding for the Willie Street uh, project so those are, those were not in the warrant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, Jennifer, if you don't mind when, when we break this in a minute to go be out in the front of the library. It'll be a little less crazy than it will be in here. Yeah. And if people would like to sign that petition, she'll have that out there. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, if you are interested in having another you know forum like this for information, please let me know. Um, as I said, I'm the chair of the library trustees, and I'd be happy to continue to organize these kinds of meetings if you feel it's useful. We don't have to make all these people come back. We can have another group of people that you might want to hear from or speak to. Um, I want to thank Ray, Frank, Chris, Cynthia, John, and Dr. Riley for being here. Absolutely the perfect size. Thank you for your patience with the size of the room and the heat. It's cool, but they know I bet it's very warm over there. Um, you're welcome to stay and hang around for as long as you like and speak. Um, and I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. So, excuse me, did I just, and I'm going to embarrass my husband. I'm actually Trina McNeil. I'm Ray McNeil's um. wife. <laughs> and I just wanted to let this community know that you could not have a better person in position that cares more about the quality of your water the quality of you as individuals, the quality of this community. I will tell you day and night if it's not his phone that's in front of his face or the tablet that's in front of his face because he's checking on something or running out in the middle of the night because there's been an issue and he's not going to sit back and wait for it to get addressed until the morning because he wants to make sure that everything is running the way it needs to be. Um, we have five children, so if you can only imagine what that's like because he's not only balancing this community but five children household that four of which are five and under. Oh. Um, <laughs> so you have the person that's crazy enough to stick this out and, and fight for your community. So really what it is is it's leaving from here tonight and going out to speak to people that maybe previously weren't as engaged in what was really happening in your town and your community and the impact it's going to have on your lives and the children's lives. And when you talk about the schools, it breaks my heart to think of that there are children that are potentially being poisoned in a community, and we, as individuals, have the power to change that. And you know, we spoke way back when for different meetings that he's had and brainstormed and talked about stuff. And you look at right, money is money, and you have five children, and you have to figure out how to balance budget, right, to be able to afford daycare and diapers and wipes and all that stuff, right? But we frivolously spend money on coffee, on cigarettes, on nicotine, on different things that we enjoy, everyone's devices they have in their hands. So when you think about that rates increasing and what that truly means to the health of an individual, and you're speaking, right, your father is suffering from exposure to stuff. Well, it's that same exposure that this community can potentially be faced with, that the cost of lawn care, lawn care health terms is going to probably far exceed what it would cost you to have rates increase to do what's right for this community to make it safe and finally change the mentality. So I know I'm not, and it's not about me, it's about you guys, and I just want to let you know that you could not have a more passionate individual. His father and his wife have shown up tonight in support of him um, because it is just, it means that much. He was up till 2 a.m. in the morning last night making sure that this slide had all the presentation and information that you need to know as members of this community. So I just ask all of you and I thank all of you for the overwhelming support that you have had um, in being able to have him continue to keep on going and keep on fighting. And I will tell you, as his wife, I will stand behind him a thousand percent because I truly feel that when he came into this community, you guys needed him here to be that voice for you and to call attention to the things that were being overlooked and people were sitting back and accepting. And along with that, um, Allison and Kate and Tom and Frank, I mean, these people behind the scenes and many other members of this community I know that I don't know who specifically each of you are, but there are names that I hear on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis. They are constantly trying to put the pieces together to figure out a way to have the impact in this community that needs to happen. And I just want you to leave tonight thinking about that and really looking at what is it, like you said, there are three individuals that are potentially changing the lives of an entire community. And do they have the right to control and dictate what they are and what should be happening? So that's what I would just say if you could just. <laughs> I
I have one, one other thing to add. At the beginning um, of the meeting, someone over here asked about uh, other towns in the same... Right. Yeah, yep. you did. And there was a report, there was a study that was done, and Ray based Ray, of course, took, um, he introduced me to a dashboard. With, um, the state. Yes. Yes. The yes. Yes. dashboard. And what we did is we looked at the water users, we drew a circle. We just kept moving out and moving out and moving out. And they were, you know, the bigger, the bigger towns could produce the water for a little bit less, well, a little bit less than what we wanted to move the budget to. When we got to Newmarket, Newmarket was really the first kind of small place that was producing water. Bigger than us, but, you know, so, so we as a small group needed to be at the 53 percentile for water and sewer over the average of the entire state. And that was the budget that I presented, but was defeated. So by this group of people that decided, hey, we, we don't want the increases, we don't want this to happen, we don't want this superintendent, he's, you know, blowing up, he, he's, he's costing us money because he communicates with CBS. He's doing his job. <laughs> He's doing his job. Finally, we got somebody that was doing his job. So, and I don't want to get into the politics of it. I just want to say that's what happened. It was an ugly meeting. I did, I'm not a politician. I didn't go to the meeting with my people. I, I didn't campaign. I didn't do any of that. I just went to the meeting because no one had ever gone to these meetings in the past. Um, the earlier meetings, four years ago, they'd be 15, 20 minutes long. That'd be it. We, I, I started asking those questions. The meeting started only an hour, an hour and a quarter. People were mad. Once I became the head commissioner, how long were the meetings? Oh, four Three hours. hours. <laughs> because we were talking over the topics. And we were, but you know, it, that's all. That's if, all if, if anybody wants to stay and have further conversation, let's do it. But let's let's break. Jen, do you mind just talk to Bert? Okay, so that's all. Do you want to sign the petition? Jen will be on the line. Right here.